Is it up? Uh, yes, we can see it. Let me introduce you. While Dr. Okay. Tan is loading, um, uh, I would like to introduce her. She's the Senior Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs and Development, uh, Professor in Chief of Division of Endocrinology at the University of Kentucky and a VA staff physician. She did a medical school internal medicine training at the University of Toronto in Canada and then completed a fellowship at the University of Washington. She's a physician scientist with administrative, clinical, educational and research activities. Her primary focus is on the care of individuals who have or are at risk for diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease, as well as directing a program providing transgender hormone therapy. Um, her research comprises basic biomedical research, use of animal models and clinical studies, so pretty much the whole spectrum of research that we have. She has served as a mentor to numerous trainees, and the majority of publications are co-authored by these trainees. I'm also very happy to report that she's the chair of the Endocrine Society Self-Assessment ESAP Committee, something we all study for five years whenever we are giving the boards. So thank you for making that um, uh, making that available to all of us so that we can all pass our votes. <laughs> all right, thank you. Um, so this was a perfect case to, to introduce the talk that I'm going to give and some of this will just sort of be a brief highlight of the, the, the aspects we already touched on in, in that case presentation. Um, I actually started with this photo for two reasons. One is this is a distant, this is the last vacation I took before COVID and it's, um, went in uh, Eastern Canada and went saw uh, an iceberg. But really for the metaphor that I think where we are with transgender care is we just have the tip of the iceberg. We are so limited by a lack of data in this patient population. Um, like I said, mostly it's retrospective studies and I think this is an ongoing challenge. So what I was going to do is briefly review the guidelines for gender affirming hormone therapy in adults um, and talk about some of the metabolic changes that we that we think are induced by gender affirming hormone therapy. And then at the end, I just want to briefly touch on on bias and strategies to combat it, because, again, this is a patient population that is generally widely underserved. Um, and I certainly know in my in my own practice, um, many of our fellows are they're all trained in, in provision of gender affirming hormone therapy. But depending on the practices that they go on to join once they graduate, there's still a general discomfort with the provision of gender affirming hormone therapy. And so even though we are training more and more um, endocrinologists in this, there's still a lack of access. So if any of you are thinking about bringing this into your practice, um, the tips at the end might help. So um, I pulled these these photos off the internet, and and you know I think one of the things that we're all really aware of is that there has been a lot more societal prevalence of of individuals seeking gender affirming hormone therapy with um, publicity and of celebrities, um, YouTube channels, TV shows, etc. And I think this is bringing more and more patients to seek therapy. Um, in my own practice, when I started here about 15 years ago, we averaged sort of five to 10 new patients a year seeking gender affirming hormone therapy. We now average three to 400 new patients a year. Um, and the population of, of Kentucky and, and Lexington is, is fairly static. So this is population growth. This is more individuals seeking care. And I would argue that while celebrities um, often say things that we wish they wouldn't, um, I think there has been a great public service for this community by bringing awareness to individuals who have gender dysphoria that there is something they can do about it. So in terms of definitions, I just want to sort of briefly touch on, on what the definitions are, because the literature, you often have to use both definitions, the name in, in, um, in PubMed and so on is, is variable. But, Per, per references, transgender is thought to be the umbrella term for um, people whose gender identity or gender expression differs from that associated with their sex assigned at birth. And transsexual is a subset of the transgender persons who have taken steps to self-identify um, and look like their preferred gender. So this doesn't necessarily mean taking hormone therapy or surgical reassignment, but at least dressing and changing name, etc. So this is partly why the literature is confusing in terms of these terms. Um, I am not a pediatric endocrinologist, and so I'm not really going to spend much time on, on the pediatric aspects, but just to remind you all that gender identity fluctuates in very young children, um, but really by puberty is generally quite um, set. 
And and so a three or four year old who stamps their foot and says, I'm a boy or I'm a girl, you know, that's 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 not necessarily gender dysphoria. But if that's persistent behavior through and continuing through puberty, then that's that's the most classic history that we see of, of gender dysphoria. And so again, with the case that was presented, when when the individual stated they sort of only felt it recently, that does raise a few red flags in my mind about whether this is truly lifelong persistence. What's more common is they felt something, they just didn't know there was a term for it, a name for it, that they could do something about it. And that's where I would again argue that the increased societal awareness has helped those individuals recognize that there's something they can do. As we discussed, there's not any clear biological, hormonal, or genetic cause found. But there's, I agree with what was what was said. There are some suggestions that there there may be some factors related to um, to, to to gender dysphoria, uh, some genetic, maybe some intrauterine hormone exposures. But there's really nothing clearly found. I think what's one of the most interesting things is is while it has often been a hidden secret um, throughout the culture, there are some historical studies that suggest that it has persisted through the ages in almost every cultures. And then just a reminder that sexual attraction and gender identity are separate items, and we actually really struggle with the words to use for, for that because of this. As mentioned, there's a very high prevalence of depression, anxiety, suicide attempts, anger, and hostility. Unfortunately, a lot of these individuals have had negative healthcare experiences, and, and so it's not uncommon for someone to take a while to warm up to a provider. Um, I don't know who, who the telephone visit your patient was with, but there are a few individuals out there who are marketing themselves as, as transgender hormone providers, and, and while some of them are probably extremely competent, I, I will personally express concerns about what I've seen on the internet. Um, I think some people have tapped into this as being, you know, a, a business avenue rather than a true provision of healthcare. Um, reminder, it's not uncommon for an individual to try to live in their birth gender, including taking um, gender specific stereotypic roles, such as in the military, um, getting married, having children, etc. While there's a lot of political noise about conversion therapy and so on, I think a lot of individuals uh, due to their own personal experiences have tried to sort of force it out of themselves. Um, and that's partly what I think relates to the high levels of mental distress. Um, I don't know if, if any of you work um, with military patients or the VA, but there's a very high prevalence in the military. This is, again, mostly trans women because mostly it is cis males going into the military. Um, but it's prevalence of, of transgender in military population is estimated to be five times the prevalence in the general population. Um, and this is, is partly related to probably that attempt to sort of suppress it in themselves. But as I mentioned, the growing social awareness, I think more people are able to name, label themselves uh, and seek therapy. So we're not truly clear that there's an increase in prevalence, but there's certainly an increase in number of individuals seeking therapy. I wanted to touch on, there's a fantastic website I listed here that, that um, has a lot of details about transgender people from history. Um, certainly here, my fellows always find it interesting to, to think about the historical cases and, and what a secret it was. So um, a couple of ones that I picked off the website to talk about were Chevalier Dion, who was from the 1700s, who was born male, but started appearing in the Queen's Court as a courtier female. Um, and apparently, according to the website, that, that was somewhat known. Um, it was a scandalous little secret. Um, Albert Cashier, it was a Union Army Civil War uh, soldier. He fought in the battles as a trans man, and apparently his gender identity was not discovered until his death. Um, Lawrence Dillon was born in 1915, had the, received the first known phalloplasty, and, and actually wrote the first known book focused on transgender. And of course, Joan of Arc has long been um, proposed to be a gender dysphoric individual. Alan Hart was a physician who was a radiologist, uh, and a TB researcher who pioneered the use of X-ray and tuberculosis detection. Um, and, and he underwent surgical transition at University of Oregon and became a professor at University of Hartford. Um, and so, you know, we've, this is not necessarily just something we're seeing now in, in the 2000s. There is certainly evidence in the history, but it's an interesting website. So one of the challenges with transgender is it's a, really difficult to estimate the the prevalence. Um, original studies estimated at kind of 0.1 to 0.4 percent of the population. More recently, the literature is estimating it's up to 1 percent of the population. 
And as I mentioned, it's not really clear it's an increase in actual prevalence, but maybe increased reporting and recognition due to societal acceptance. There are, if you look by, by nations, there are countries such as Thailand and the Netherlands that had been had longer duration of social acceptance and appeared to have higher prevalence than we did say here in the US. Um, and there's some countries that report 0% prevalence and obviously um, most of us would be skeptical. We think it's related to the political climate in certain countries. Um, one of the challenges that we, we didn't touch on in that case, and I'm, I don't, we, we can discuss perhaps at the end, is those individuals who identify as gender fluid or non-binary. Um, and we are starting to see more and more individuals present with that, and that's a bit of a challenge to manage because our hormone affirming therapy is pretty binary in many, many ways. In terms of the ratio of trans men versus trans women, the, the estimates vary from sort of one to one to, to four to one for trans women to trans men. We, it's, we just really don't know. So I'm gonna briefly talk on the provision of gender affirming hormone therapy and, and the different sources that I cite, uh, I don't necessarily reference them on each slide, but the Endocrine Society guideline, um, University of California, San Francisco has, has quite a good public profile, the WPATH and Harry Benjamin sites. So I'm going to start talking about male to female transition. And of course, the goals of gender affirming hormone therapy is to improve the dysphoria and relieve the mental distress, relieve the suicidal ideation, anxiety, depression. You want to uh, induce body changes as desired. And then metabolically, most of the guidelines suggest we target an estradiol level in the adult cis woman range, which is between 100 and 200 picogram per mil through most of the month. Obviously, there's a spike with cycling. And then most guidelines argue that we should try to suppress the testosterone to the adult cis women range, which is less than 50 nanograms per deciliter. However, it's well known that, that suppression of testosterone doesn't always occur, and it's, we really have no clear guidelines of what to do if suppression does not occur. So the gender affirming hormone therapy protocols that most of us use are oral estradiol. And as mentioned, we use 17 beta estradiol, not ethanol estradiol. Um, and that comes in oral forms, in transdermal forms, or in injectable forms. I think the most common and the most cost effective is the oral form. In terms of antiandrogens, this is where we are challenged in this country. Spironolactone is about the best we have. And I think we all know it's fairly wimpy as an antiandrogen. Um, five alpha reductase inhibitors can be used, GnRH analogs or orchiectomy. In Europe, um, they have other agents, but they were not approved by the FDA. One of the tips I'm going to mention is um, oral estradiol is meant to be taken PO and not sublingual. And there is um, a few small studies suggesting that if individuals take it sublingually, they get incredibly high levels but they don't last the 24 hours. And so this is a concern when we think about the risks. So I, I have just anecdotally some of patients in my practice um, who were taking it sublingually. And I told you the target is 100 to 200 picograms per mil. I had an individual that when we looked back over their records, if they had estradiol levels drawn, you know, between 8 a.m. and noon, we saw levels of four, five, 600. But when they had estradiol levels drawn towards the later end of the day, they were back in the cis male range. And I think that's the profile with sublingual. So we always counsel our patients that it's meant to be taken PO and lead to steady state levels that way. Transdermal patches are theoretically the safest. Um, I have very few patients who like them. There's a lot of issues with reaction to the adhesive. Um, they're difficult to titrate um, and they just fall off. So it gets a little expensive because instead of lasting for the week that they're supposed to, most individuals say they have to replace them twice a week. And then um, I am estradiol. There's a lot of chatter on the internet that this leads to faster body changes. As far as I can tell, there's absolutely no clinical trial evidence that uh, body changes happen faster with injectable than with um, oral. And one of my concerns with injectable medications is it's it's um, harder to titrate and it's harder to um, monitor the levels because patients, you know, slight errors in the dosing with the syringe can lead to pretty significant variations in the plasma level. So I prefer to use oral estradiol where possible. 
And then, of course, the effects on risks of estradiol, the desired effects that most of our trans women are seeking is breast development and feminization of body shape, so hips and thighs. Um, obviously, one of the most gratifying reasons to treat this population is the improved mood. I, I I've got to say, when I see the patients who start hormone therapy and they come back for their first visit, if they're not smiling, I'm so disappointed because it's it's such a gratifying to see patients finally um, feeling better, even though body changes may not have happened yet. I mark decreased libido as either a desired effect or a risk. Um, again, sexual function and sexual identity are very different than gender identity. And for some individuals, this is desired. And for some individuals, it is not. Um, I somewhat joke that it's Murphy's Law, that those who, who really do not want their uh, male body parts functioning have almost no effects, and those who do have complete suppression. So it's something to cancel. Officially, there's decreased testicular volume. It's negligible, really, clinically, but it's, it's, the testes can get a little bit um, softer. In terms of risks, of course, we worry about hypertriglyceridemia and risk of pancreatitis, especially if the triglycerides get above 1,000. Um, and as mentioned in, in the previous talk, this seems to be a sort of a subset of individuals, both cis women and trans women, who respond to this genetic predisposition, perhaps. Um, overall, there does not appear to be a consistent increase in triglycerides with estrogen therapy, other than a few individuals who might have extreme responses. We really do need to worry about thrombosis. And of course, a lot of the signal came out um, from Women's Health and the HER study when we were talking about postmenopausal estrogen therapy. Um, but certainly young cis women to go on oral contraceptives can, can get thrombosis, especially in obese or smokers. So something to think very carefully about. There's a theoretical increased risk for breast cancer. There's not great data on it. I'll share in a little bit what we have. There's a theoretical risk for elevated prolactin, not really clear if there's any functional consequence to this. And then of course, estrogen can increase migraines and cholelithiasis in some individuals. For spironolactone, you know, the desired effects for trans women is to decrease facial and body hair. Um, those of you with experience with this will probably agree that spironolactone is fairly wimpy at doing that, although there can be some benefit. And again, it may be a desired effect to have decreased libido and decreased erections, or it may not. Risks, of course, are hyperkalemia, polyuria, and hypotension, although, of course, spironolactone is a relatively weak diuretic, and this tends to be a fairly infrequent occurrence, at least in my practice. I get asked a lot about the progestogens and what to use here, and there's really a challenge. This is, again, somewhere we're lacking in the literature. I, I would argue that there's poor evidence for or against their use. There is a ton of anecdotal reports and chatter on the internet about this. Um, there's lots of conviction that uh, use of progestogens increases the breast growth um, and shape, but there's absolutely no real clinical evidence to, to support that. And of course, there are risks with the progestogens, such as depression, weight gain, nausea, and then theoretical concerns about cardiovascular and breast cancer risk if we extrapolate from uh, postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy studies. So in general, I tend not to use progestogens. If I have a handful of patients who, who are on them, maybe they've started at it from another provider and are reluctant to um, stop them. The few patients that I do have who I had started on progestins generally don't continue them over time, um, partly due to the side effects. So it, that one still seems variable in another area we need greater uh, research. In terms of timing, um, you address this in the, in the case study for trans men, for trans women, the onset varies widely. Uh, usually there's a little bit of breast tenderness in the first few months, um, but we, we counsel patients that in, in effect this is puberty round two, and they're going to see maximal development uh, by two to three years of therapy, assuming hormone levels are at range. Um, decreased facial hair is slow. Um, as we know, spironolactone really just inhibits new follicle development, uh, and so existing hair doesn't suddenly fall out when we, we treat the patients. And I just counsel patients that we almost never meet their desires and that they're going to need to do something else like uh, laser, electrolysis, et cetera. In general, we think that the maximum feminization is going to occur about two to three years in on therapy, and it's mostly irreversible. So once they have developed breast tissue, even if they cease estrogen therapy, it will continue. It will be there. It won't, it won't regress. So one of the things that we tried to look at um, was, was a 
try to get some prediction of what doses are needed. So this was a retrospective study done by a medical student working with me a couple of years ago. Um, and we looked at uh, a population of 84 trans women and 71 trans men. I'm going to show you the trans women part first. Um, of the 84 trans women and 71 trans men, only 40 and 54 respectively achieved hormone levels in the target range. Um, and this was unique to our practice. It wasn't just my, my patient practice. I have four, another physician and, and four APPs who, who do uh, gender affirming hormone therapy. But in general, we all follow the same kind of protocol. So um, the goal was to determine what dose an individual needs to achieve a target range of hormone therapy and see if we could find a way to predict it. So we took the, um, the, the trans women and we looked at what their estradiol dose was. We, we selected this to just the individuals on oral therapy um, and looked at what their plasma levels were. And there was a correlation in that those on higher doses tended to have um, higher plasma estradiol levels, but you can see an enormous range at every estradiol dose. If we limited it to just the group who achieved the target range, and we define the target range here as 90 to 200, because often if we achieve a plasma level of 90, we're not necessarily going to titrate the dose. Um, but if we restricted it to just that population and looked if there was a correlation with dose, there really wasn't. Um, so, so simple dose didn't seem to predict who would get to uh, therapeutic range. Then what we did was looked at whether their BMI would be predictive. So knowing that uh, cis men have higher estrogen levels than, than lean, uh, obese cis men have higher estrogen levels than, than lean cis men, we thought maybe BMI was a, a predictor. And we had a significant negative correlation here so that, again, this is restricted to um, just the individuals who achieved the plasma estradiol levels at target range, just looking at what their BMI was. And in general, and then looking at what the dose was, in general, the leaner individuals needed higher estrogen doses and the obese individuals needed lower estrogen doses to predict. Unfortunately, it's a fairly small population. We couldn't come out with um, you know, a formulary calculator to calculate doses. But, but in general, this data has led us to initiate doses at slightly different levels for lean versus obese. So in general, for our lean individuals, we'll start at somewhat higher doses. And for obese individuals, we'll start at the lower doses. Um, and then we titrate over time. So this has changed our practice a little bit because we used to start kind of everybody at the lower doses. And then we basically thought that the lean individuals were just getting, taking a lot longer to get to therapeutic levels for them. So we do titrate doses and the guidelines generally suggest this, but there's very little evidence to how to guide titration, how frequent, what parameters to measure other than plasma levels. Um, in general, if an individual is having breast tenderness, they're having estrogen effect. And so even if their plasma levels aren't necessarily a goal, they are still having some of the body changes induced. At this point, there's really no evidence that getting them to the target plasma level faster has any difference in rate of change. Again, this is a lack of, of data. So in general, what I do is start at the levels I mentioned based on, on BMI and titrate based on symptoms and, and blood levels. Um, I tend to titrate in sort of six to 12 month intervals or, or when the breast tenderness lessens. And that's sort of a sign that maybe the estrogen is where it, you know, effect is wearing off. I'll measure a level and if they're not at target, that's when I'll titrate. The other thing, and I'm going to come back to this in a minute, is that even though the estradiol may be at target range, the testosterone may not be fully suppressed. And this is a challenge. We really don't know what to do with these individuals. In terms of monitoring, um, I generally will get baseline levels prior to initiation of therapy. Um, if, if they've had this within the last year or so from a primary care physician or something, I don't repeat them necessarily. But in my experience, a lot of these individuals maybe have not seen any medical attention for years. Um, and so I'd get some baseline lipid levels and a comprehensive metabolic panel just to screen for other health comorbidities. Do we have to worry about fatty liver? Do they have dyslipidemia? Do they have hypertriglyceridemia to start with? Um, and I want to know what renal function and potassium are if I'm going to start spironolactone. Endocrine Society guidelines and some of the others recommend repeating these at three to six month intervals. Um, I think that's excessive personally. And so I generally uh, do sort of a safety check 
once they start hormone therapy. And then I only repeat all of those tests um, with dose changes or once they're stable every one to two years. And it's getting better in terms of insurance coverage, but I have really struggled over the years where a lot of times insurance flat out denies covering for gender transition and then we'll so, um, assess these labs. So, so that's part of the reason I try to be a little bit more restrictive and, and choose wisely in, in lab tests. So as stated, the goal is to get the estradiol and testosterone levels to the normal cis female range, premenopausal range. So serum estradiol in the 100 to 200 picogram range and testosterone less than 55. Um, and again, I don't normally measure the testosterone because I don't know what to do about it. And I think it just causes more anxiety. I also rarely measure prolactin if they're not having any, um, any you know, symptoms that, that make me concerned because I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do about it. And so I just don't measure it necessarily because knowing it's, knowing it's elevated doesn't just causes anxiety for the patient perhaps without any, um, any benefit, no interventions about it. In general, you're doing all the normal things. You're monitoring their weight, their blood pressure, you monitor lipids over time. And then if they're on spironolactone, I do monitor potassium. So I'm going to share with you some data that we got from our clinic. This is another small retrospective study. And I think the, the case presentation earlier showed for trans men some larger data sets, but I'll just show you what we had. Um, this was the same medical student doing a study with me. Um, and the hormone levels for the patients in the study were not necessarily at goal, but we looked at to see over time what happened to the individuals as they went from baseline or before gender affirming hormone therapy to it, hormone therapy. Um, and the majority at this point were on an oral estradiol between one and four milligrams a day and spironolactone 100, some at 200 milligrams per day. And it's a busy slide. What we had was about 33 patients that we, we started with, 30 who had a three month follow-up and 15 who had a follow-up between six and 18 months later. Um, if they had multiple follow-up visits, we just selected one data point. And I've highlighted the two changes we saw. We did see a significant increase in HDL levels, um, and we saw a significant decrease in creatinine levels, and we did not see any other significant changes. And so while this is a, a very small retrospective single institution study, it actually fairly replicates what we see in the literature. Although there's this theoretical risk of hypertriglyceridemia with estrogen therapy, it just seems to be not across the board in the population, but just in a few individuals who have the susceptibility. And again, there's a theoretical concern of hyperkalemia, and there was a trend towards increased potassium levels, as you can see, but uh, this did not reach statistical significance. And again, in individuals who um, don't have renal dysfunction, I would say hyperkalemia is fairly rare in my experience. A couple of concerns and issues and things to remind patients about when you're doing gender affirming hormone therapy for trans women is unfortunately, if you're starting in adulthood, there is absolutely no effect on the voice. So the pu pu pubertal testosterone surge caused thickening of the vocal cords and that drops the pitch of the voice. So that is a structural change in the vocal cords. Um, and this is probably one of the most frustrating things I think for our, our patients. There's also no real effect on male pattern balding. And again, this could be very distressing for some of our patients. So I do counsel them about that. In terms of fertility, it is possible to ca that hormone therapy will cause infertility, but I also counsel them it is not guaranteed birth control and that if they uh, do not want to um, have a child, they need to use another form of birth control as well. In general, I would say, um, the gender dysphoria improves with gender affirming hormone therapy, but not all of the mental health issues are completely due to gender dysphoria. And so it doesn't necessarily alleviate or completely relieve their depression and anxiety. I generally counsel my patients that if they're on mental health medications that we should not adjust those until they've been on gender affirming hormone therapy for at least a year and then only do so under the guidance of whoever's prescribing it, their psychiatrist or so on, um, just to see and it's, it's transitioning is, is a stress for sure. And I don't want to add, you know, uh, changes in their psychiatric medications on top of the stress of transitioning. And then one of the challenges that I have, and I'd love to discuss a little bit at the end is what to do with the aging male to female 
patients? What do we do with when, when they should be at the age of menopause? And, and what do we do about their cardiovascular risk? You know, we know that we shouldn't be starting estrogen in, in cis women more than say five, 10 years post-menopause. That seems to be the increased risk. What do we do with our trans women? And I think that's an, a challenge as we're seeing more and more uh, patients who are now aging and, and not sure what to do with them. I also want to point out this one study that looked at testosterone suppression. So this is a study, it's a retrospective study of 98 women who were on oral estradiol and spironolactone. Now I point out that the estradiol levels were reported at between 33 and 99 picograms per mil, so really subtherapeutic. Um, but they, they stratified the patients in several different ways. When they stratified by age or if they stratified by spironolactone dose, they did not see any difference in testosterone levels. Um, the, the two graphs I chose to show you is they stratified by achieved testosterone levels. And what you can see, they just did by quartiles. And what you can see is this one group had a nice suppression of testosterone levels over time and it stayed down. Um, but the other groups had maybe some drop in testosterone, but didn't suppress to less than that target that the endocrine society and other guidelines say. And then this final quartile didn't really suppress at all. And so I think this is something we see in our in pa individual patients. And at this point, we really don't know what to do about it other than perhaps consider, you know, orchiectomy. Um, they also did try to look at uh, BMI to see if that had an impact on testosterone suppression. And really collectively, it did not. Um, so you can see that those who were obese had tended to have lower testosterone levels at baseline, as we would expect, um, and perhaps dropped a little faster, um, but really didn't necessarily get down to that level of suppression that the guidelines recommend. So again, this is an ongoing challenge with what to do with these individuals in terms of testosterone levels. It seems that some will respond and to fully suppress and, and many will not. Um, and this is an ongoing source of anxiety for the patients and for the providers. Let me switch gears and, and talk about a female to male transition. And as we just went over the case, there's, I'll just, I'll briefly touch on this. So again, the goals are to improve dysphoria, to induce body changes as desired, which is masculination, facial hair, and deepening of the voice. I will point out that once we give an individual testosterone, the vocal cords thicken, the pitch drops. And so for trans men, the change in voice is actually one of the most rewarding things they often say. Amenorrhea is a goal. It does not always occur, and it's really unclear at this time what to do if testosterone is a goal and they are still having menses. Um, that's, a, that's an ongoing challenge. Metabolically, the most guidelines recommend to get testosterone levels into the cis male normal range, um, and it does depend by lab, but often we're aiming sort of at the 200 to 900 nanograms uh, per deciliter range, um, and then often the guidelines suggest suppression of estradiol to less than 50. And again, this may or may not always occur. Treat, treatment of trans men basically consists of administration of androgens. We don't need to do a specific anti-estrogen because usually administration of androgens suppresses estrogen, but it doesn't, as I mentioned, doesn't always. Um, I would say it's starting to transition a little bit more how much insurance is covering the transdermal forms rather than the depot forms. But I would say the majority of my practice is still on the depot forms and usually in dose ranges of about 100 to 200 milligrams every one to two weeks. Um, I personally prefer the transdermal forms for patients. I think it gives them a much better steady state level. A lot of my patients on the injectable forms talk about mood swings um, and sort of sensitivity to the timing of the dose. So we often start at two week intervals and then if they're noticing sort of, you know, fatigue and um, lower libido, you know, the last few days before an injection, we'll, we'll play with the dose intervals uh, to go to weekly or 10 days intervals, perhaps. The desired effects, as I mentioned, the deepening of the voice, that's a very gratifying thing. Um, I got to admit, I kind of love the pubertal squeaking, and I always warn my patients about that. Not everyone gets it, of course, but it can be distressing if you're a trans man in your 20s or 30s or 40s to go through that pubertal squeaking phase, so I do warn them about that. Um, increase in facial and body hair. And again, as mentioned in the case presentation, the timing of that varies widely, but usually it's many months in. Uh, masculinization of appearance and development of musculature. I always, I always tell patients that testosterone is, is not the drug that the gym rats abuse. Um, 
and, and we don't want them to abuse other <laughs> genetic steroids, but that if they exercise and in particular do more sort of lifting, that they'll start seeing some change in definition. Amenorrhea is almost universally desired. Uh, clitoral enlargement and increased libido may or may not be desired, but often are seen, and so it's something to counsel patients about and warn them. The risks, of course, include male pattern balding, and I would say this is really devastating for many patients. Um, and, and so I actually warn patients before starting. We talked about the acne, and that's, again, a very common problem. Metabolically, one of the biggest concerns we have is thrombosis and polycythemia. Um, there's one of the challenges we face with, with gender-affirming hormone therapy is what sex is normal range to use. Um, I say I'm transitioning them to be male, and I use the normal male range for hemoglobin and hematocrit, which of course is higher than the, the normal female range. Um, but if they go higher than the normal male range, then I have concerns. Infertility is, is a risk, um, and it may be permanent, but it's of course not guaranteed. So I do also counsel about use of birth control if they are sexually active with someone who would get them pregnant um, and, and don't want to have uh, conception. As mentioned, lipid, dyslipidemia, particularly a drop in HDL is a risk, and whether this has impact on cardiovascular outcomes is a concern. And then there's a theoretical concern um, of testosterone therapy with increased central or visceral obesity. Timing, again, varies widely. I would say in general, most patients experience some deepening of the voice within two to six months. Amenorrhea, again, within the first, say, two to six months. If menses persist, I do recommend uh, a pelvic exam just to make sure we're not missing something else. Um, I also counsel patients that as long as they own a uterus, they should have pap tests and things like that. Uh, facial hair um, and body hair, again, tend to start seeing it within two to six months. Maximum effects tend to be at two to three years and are most irreversible. And so again, we've had patients who have taken testosterone as gender affirming hormone therapy, and then for whatever reason, financial or, or other life circumstances, or, or perhaps a change of their, change in their minds have stopped it. Um, the deepening of the voice, the, the growth of body and facial hair persist even after they're off it. Many of our trans men bind their breasts. Um, testosterone therapy has minimal effects on breasts. And while so many, many bind while waiting surgery, and we just said to counsel our patients that they need to be careful because really tight binding can compromise pulmonary function and also increase the risk of thrombosis in breast veins just due to compression. So this is something I do counsel patients about. I would say many patients end up looking for what they say is top surgery, but of course it's mastectomy. As mentioned, there's the infertility concern. And then as mentioned, if menses um, continue despite testosterone levels being at goal, it's not really clear what to do. And different options include use of a progestational agent, um, and going through endometrial ablation or actually going through hysterectomy. So in terms of what doses are needed, this is the same study I showed you before. I'm now showing you the trans men. So um, these in, were individuals only on injectable testosterone, um, but we either at weekly 10 day or 14 day dosing. So what we did is we reported it as their daily testosterone dose. Um, and so when we looked at plasma testosterone levels versus their testosterone dose, there was a positive correlation. So in general, the higher dose that they are on in daily equivalents led to higher plasma levels. We, when we restricted it to just that population that achieved the testosterone levels at goal, which I think in our lab was between about 300 and 900, um, there was absolutely no correlation with dose. So um, this is not that dissimilar to what we saw with the trans women. But when we looked at to see whether BMI would predict dose, so again, it's BMI along the x-axis versus the effective dose, that's the dose that achieved testo plasma testosterone levels at goals. Here we found a positive correlation so that those on the leaner end needed lower doses and those on the obese end needed higher doses. So again, a small study and um, too much variation to really calculate um, a dose you know, calculation formula. But in general, we will tend to use uh, lower doses for lean individuals and higher doses, starting doses for our obese individuals. This is the same uh, study I showed you before in terms of the metabolic effects. So again, this is a group of trans men, smaller numbers here, and, and 
not all were had testosterone levels at had goal. Um, and we only had 19 at baseline, 16 who, who had data at the first follow-up visit and, and 10 who had data the second follow-up visit. So a very small study. Um, what we what we found was an apparent increase in BMI at the first visit. Now, again, the number is very small, but it was not sustained at the second follow-up visit. Um, we, we don't have any measures to know if this is change in adiposity or change in musculature, et cetera. But the creatinine does go up significantly, suggesting that perhaps there is some increased musculature. We did see a significant increase in hemoglobin and hematocrit, um, but again, the majority of them stayed within the normal male range. We, in this study, again, very small, had a trend towards decreased HDL, did not reach statistical significance, and none, none of the other changes were significant. Looking at the other literature with much larger patient cohorts, uh, in general, there is a suppression of HDL, um, increase in hemoglobin and hematocrit, and variable effects, depending on the study, on other parameters. Monitoring um, the difference for trans men is I do follow their blood count. So I do a CBC or hemogram um, again at baseline prior to therapy and then initial visit and then with dose changes measure. I measure testosterone. The goal is to get testosterone to sort of the mid normal cis male range. Um, I again don't really measure estradiol uh, because we don't necessarily know what to do about it. And if they're on the injectable forms in general, we want to measure at midpoint between the injections. If you measure a day or two after the dose, you might see very high levels. And if you measure a day or two before the next dose, you might have some trough levels, which is difficult to interpret. So just to briefly touch on um, some of the other topics we, we mentioned earlier with the case presentation, there was a retrospective nationwide study in the Netherlands looking at breast cancer occurrence, trying to compare it in trans men and trans women to cis men and cis women. So they had a total of 15 cases of breast cancer in over 2,000 uh, trans women, which was 47-fold above that expected for cis men, suggesting that, yes, there increases um, breast cancer risk compared to cis men but 0.3-fold of the rates expected for cis women. So estrogen therapy in trans women does appear to increase the risk of breast cancer compared to cis men, but not to the extent seen in cis women. For their trans men, they had four cases in over 1,200 trans men, um, and that was much lower than expected for either cis men or cis women, so potentially beneficial effects there. A few other safety outcomes, there's been a, several studies that have looked at bone mineral density. Um, in general, they don't find changes in uh, trans men, um, but an increase in bone mineral density at the lumbar spine in trans women in this one study. There's not any consistent effect on blood pressure for either trans men or trans women. Um, and there's been some theoretical concerns about uh, hormone-induced impact on liver injury, and overall studies have found very, very low rates of liver injury, um, and most of the studies, including the one I cited here, just looked at, at transaminases. Um, we don't really have pathology outcomes. So collectively, it appears that hormone-affirming uh, therapy is, is safe for the population, but again, it's vastly understudied. I think we also need to be aware of primary care issues with this population. And so I just literally say to my patients, we got to take care of the body parts you have. So for, for trans men, they may be getting prostate exams and mammograms as they age. Um, uh, for, sorry, for trans women, for trans men, you know, they need pelvic exams. And if they haven't had, had top surgery, they need mammograms. And this is often another huge barrier to therapy because uh, these patients, especially for trans men, they don't want to go to the gynecologist. So this is, again, where having a multidisciplinary team is, is hugely helpful. So one of our gynecologists actually has a um, half-day clinic a week that is just for trans men. We have sufficient patient population um, that it's just a trans man clinic. And that way, you know, there's a bunch of men sitting in the waiting room, not, not a single man with a bunch of women. Uh, and so that has really increased acceptance rates in our population of, of having the routine primary care screenings. 
Special populations, I mentioned briefly aging, there really at this point is no guidelines, no data, no evidence to how to manage aging transgender patients. We know that in, trans, in cis women, they go through the menopause and there's an abrupt drop in, in estrogen level. Should we be mimicking that um, with, with prescription estrogen in, in trans women? With trans men, there's sort of a more gradual decline of, of testosterone levels with aging. Again, should we be mimicking that? We, we just really don't know. I generally am very reluctant to initiate gender affirming hormone therapy in trans women who are more than 55, 60 years of age, based on the WHI and HERS trials that suggested that starting estrogen therapy in cis women more than five to 10 years after the menopause um, had increased risks of thrombosis and cardiovascular disease. But does a trans woman have that same risk? We just have no idea. And so this is an ongoing challenge. Then what do we do with patients who present for care but have known cardiovascular disease or, or different types of cancers? And what, what are the, there, there's no guidelines. What is the evidence that hormone therapy could be detrimental or, or even beneficial for this population? So in these situations, um, when, when I face it, I just get into discussions with our cardiologists and oncologists and we try to make an individual discussion. But again, I think as we're seeing more and more individuals seeking gender affirming hormone therapy, we, we really need to have some better research. I just really briefly want to touch on societal bias. Um, I assume you guys use EPIC. We are actually launching EPIC in 16 days, so um, I'm hoping it goes well. <laughs> I'm very nervous, um, but I do like that EPIC has the ability to, to use um, names and, and terminology. Um, our current system does as well. So provide a supportive environment in your healthcare as best you can. You know, look for and use AKA names um, as best you can. Don't, don't name shame them. A lot of individuals feel their birth name is um, a, a very negative and insulting term. Try to use the pronouns consistent with a patient's preference. If you're not sure, ask. And if you mess up, apologize. And it's hard, but sometimes our eyes are telling us a different thing than we're trying to, to say, especially early in therapy when the transitions are pretty minimal. And, and so just be very upfront about it. Train your staff, your, your techs, your front desk staff, um, all to, to be culturally aware of this. Um, maintain privacy, of course. Uh, many of these individuals are not necessarily full-time transitioned in their day jobs and their day lives due to societal pressures and what their employment is. Um, there are still many, many states and many, many uh, large companies that literally have no protection for transgendered individuals and they could be fired just for being different. In general, if you can, uh, provide single-user restrooms uh, in your clinical spaces for these individuals and other supportive environmental features. Um, it's, it's a challenge. My, my practice is completely integrated with pediatrics, and we have had some, we, we have both multi-user and single-user restrooms, and we have had some complaints from, from patients or, or from parents of children when, when they see someone who doesn't look the way they think in their, in their restroom. So uh, we always make sure that we point out that while the, the most public restroom is a multi-user, just around the corner, we have single-user restrooms and we make sure our front desk let our, our patients know that. Again, make sure your intake forms and all of your clinical documentation offers transgender as an option, not just the binary M and F. Um, General things, you, you probably already do this, but, but ask about relationship status instead of marital status um, and, and try to just be open and non-judgmental in the phrasing you use. A particular pearl is to ask what they, name they want to be called in the clinic setting, but also what name they want in communication, such as phone calls or letters. Because again, some of these individuals, uh, depending on their circumstances, um, may or may not be completely transitioned in their private life. Um, in particular, I have a lot of uh, patients who are, you know, young adults still living at home without supportive parents. And, and if I call and, and a parent asks the, answers the phone and I use their, their new name rather than their birth name, um, it could cause challenges for them. So we actually note in our charts that in clinic and in person, they would like to be called one name, but all communication should be with the other name. Little tips like that. I um, uh, strongly believe we need to continue to prime, counsel them about primary care issues related to, again, the body parts they have present. Um, 
in our lab orders, we are able to in indicate that this is a transgendered individuals and request the normal range for the transition gender, because um, otherwise you'll get lots of lab values flagged low or high because they'll come back with the cisgender range. And then one of the big debates that we have is should the gender flag be changed solely to the new gender? So in many of the electronic health systems, you can say they are male, they are female, or you can say they are trans, male, trans, female, or non-binary. I argue that it's very important for it, all healthcare providers to know if they are transgendered or not. Um, but this is, um, this is very politically sensitive with many patients. The case I cite always with patients is, is a fairly well-known report that made into the public literature of an obese male who showed up in the emergency room um, with belly pain, the, the ER doctors diagnosed viral gastroenteritis, gave him an IV and, and kind of, you know, put him, put him to the side um, and, and the baby was still born a few hours later. So we just have to be aware that, you know, if somebody's visible appearance looks one, one gender or the other, but doesn't match their, um, their birth sex and, and we don't know what parts are there, if you will, I think it is important that we, we flag the charts. Um, the other thing is sexual orientation. I have no idea what terms to use. So um, I just, I just, you know, it's important to talk about sexual function with our patients. Um, but I try to stay away from the words heterosexual or homosexual because I don't know what to use based on their new gender, their, sister, their birth gender. Um, I, I think it's confusing terminology. And, and so finally, but on behalf of this patient population that is so widely underserved, I want to say thank you for all that, that you do to train your fellows and to provide care for this patient population. And I really look forward to um, increasing research to how to best manage this patient population. And with that, I will stop. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Danov. That was a great presentation and a wonderful roadmap for anybody who might be thinking of um, gender affirming therapy uh, clinic, either starting it or developing it. Um, I think um, 20 years ago, a lot of fellowship programs did not really aim to train their fellows in this um, field of endocrinology, but now the fellowship programs are catching up and this is leading to better availability of care for these patients. Um, I think it's interesting you point out the societal bias as well as the clinic changes that you have to make to provide better care for these patients. I remember in residency, we had a trans man and the question was, if it's an inpatient room with two patients, where should that patient be housed? Should this person be housed with a cis male or a cis female? So some of these issues do come up and I think it's important to train staff um, for these kind of issues that crop up. Um, I do say that I do feel it's, it is a very difficult branch of endocrinology, and I do send my patients to one of my better trained colleagues like Dr. Abdullah here. Uh, Dr. Abdullah, do you have a question or comment? Um, actually, I do. Dr. Tanik, thank you so much. Um, I, you touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, we had two patients in the last three months um, that we discussed in our center that were um, regretting their transition and they actually wanted to de-transition. It was almost as if they had dysphoria with the gender that they had chosen. And this was years after one such patient was surgically as well as hormonally transitioned and another was just um, on medical therapy. So I'm curious to know your experience. Um, would you be willing to share your, your thoughts with us on that? Yeah, I, I've had a handful to do that too. And it's it's a huge transition. I I I would say more commonly I have patients who, in addition to gender dysphoria, have another psychiatric diagnosis. And and those are challenging too because you know, one year they're on, one year they're off, depending on, on what's going on with their other mood. So um, this is a huge challenge, and I don't have a simple answer. Most of the changes are are permanent. Um it's interesting for trans women, if they stop medication, actually things like male pattern facial hair might come back, but the breasts don't necessarily regress. And so um, it's, a, it's an interesting balance. Uh, the one thing I feel co relatively confident on is we're not necessarily doing any long-term harm in terms of bone health, cardiovascular health, as long as they have 
either estrogen or testosterone, whether it's um, administrative therapy or endogenous therapy, if they've gone through surgical reassignment, then I'm concerned that that they are basically, you know, they, they stop taking um, the, the, the new gender hormone, but they don't have any cis hormone because they've had ophrectomy or orchiectomy is appropriate. Um, I Then I usually do recommend some hormone supplementation, whether it's back to sort of cisgender or transgender, just again for bone health and so on. But it's a challenge. Yeah. Um, I'd say in general, in my experience, it's very rare. It tends to be people who have other psychiatric diagnoses as well. Thank you. Yeah, that patient um, is intensely working with our, our mental health therapist, but that's that's great to hear your experience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. One more thing. I think uh, what we didn't really talk about is fertility preservation in these patients. And the fact that I know, um, you know, freezing eggs has become something that has come into the societal eye recently. And uh, I don't know, insurance really doesn't cover these kind of procedures. So how do you counsel those patients? And is there a reason to delay treatment while they are looking into that? Yeah, that's another great question. So so for trans women, sperm banking is relatively easy, relatively affordable, and we just recommend that before they initiate therapy. Um, for trans men, like you said, egg, egg banking is questionable. It's it's really not a standard of care. It's not well covered, and it's, it's not great documents. Um, I I see a lot of, I don't, I don't see children, so a lot of my patients are 18, 19, 20 years old, you know, first emerging from their family homes and, and seeking to transition. Um, I'm also the parent of um, an 18 and a 22 year old. And at this point, they all say they're never, ever going to have kids. And I think that's, you know, age appropriate. They haven't made some of these major life decisions. And, and it's a challenge to um, counsel them because they think, oh, I never want kids. But if I do, I just want to, I'll just adopt. Then I have another group of patients who are now, you know, their mid thirties and, and married or, or partnered and, and rethinking that decision. And it can be a huge challenge. Um, I have had some pregnant men in my clinic, um, sometimes intentional, sometimes not. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, I think, again, this is where the mental health counseling, I, as I mentioned earlier, I don't do an informed consent document, but we do have extensive discussions and counseling uh, about it. Um, it's, it's, there's no simple answers, I think. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Feynman, do you have a comment or a question? Well, first of all, thanks so much. It was a delight. The only question that I would have is, the, at least in my experience, the end result on many of these patients has been less than satisfactory. And I actually had much disappointment. On the other hand, uh, some of the patients fit into society so super well uh, that it uh, made me actually smile on occasion saying, boy, you did such a nice job. So that's just a comment. My concern is above all, do no harm. And ultimately we really don't know where we're headed. You dealt with uh, when do you slow down therapy maybe at the menopausal age as we get older if we're uh, original males. Uh, all of these are things that uh, certainly need to be gauged in the future. The most important question that I have, though, is off topic. Do you think that the Maple Leafs will win the Stanley Cup? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, gosh, if I say anything out loud, I'll jinx everything. So. <laughs> um. I, I share your comment. I share your concerns and comments about about the transition. And I think one of the questions that I, I do have is um, what's right for them, right? So so a lot of patients talk about passing. Um, and what does it mean to pass? That's very different. I, I would actually say one of the more challenging things I'm seeing now is patients who who are non-binary or gender fluid and um, want to be, you know, masculine in the winter and feminine in the summer and, and challenges there. So it's a huge range. I think the most gratifying thing about treating this patient population is what their, um, their, their mental state improves. So. All right. Um, we have another question. Dr. Maida, you have a question or a comment? 
I must admit, that was, a, that was a great presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I must admit that some of my personal experience is a bit different. I rarely use a two weekly testosterone to use a much higher dose, and there's a significant variation. If you look at the clearance of testosterone over two weeks, it really does go down very much. So I tend to use a lower dose every week, and that tends to help me both with my, in terms of how much of a turn on of the hematocrit I get, as well as the fact that they get much less variations in terms of the testosterone level. And most of my patients, have actually, I'm ashamed to say, never got the option of buying a two week. They only tell them about one. Also about the, uh, the fact that when you have patients uh, whose testosterone doesn't seem to uh, respond very well, I find that the addition of a progestase agent really does slam the testosterone down very well. And so I have to that early on, and once the testosterone is down, then I tend to withdraw the uh, progestase agent. Interesting. I mean, I'd love to see some research on that published because there's just so little about that. So if you have a good patient population, that might be a great chart review study well, for someone to do. I have the largest patient population in Canada now. I think uh, much less than the population. So in Canada, I have a very large population of uh, individuals. But anyway, that's, that's just one of my, over the years, that's just somehow come out of the thing. The other issue is, and I'm interested in what you said. I must admit, and maybe this is my fault, but I tend to want to complete the process. I, I hate the fact that people to be on hormonal therapy and not go for the final uh, changes in anatomy. Uh, I think it's it's important. And I'll remember a patient of mine always, 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 who basically said, you know, I, I regret the fact that uh, I have to go into a cubicle when I go into a washroom. And I said, what difference does it make? And he says, no, it's not the difference is the feet are still point, pointing the wrong way. Hmm. And I think it's important to sort of understand that these are things that they are sensitized to and that standing and being is different from sitting and being, and you can see the difference on, in, the, in the cubicle. So I think it's sort of important to finish what we start, and I feel very strongly that we allow this to linger and linger and linger and not complete what we started. Yeah, thank, no, thank you. I think those are, those are great comments. I, actually, I appreciate your comment about um, lower but more frequent doses of testosterone. I, I, I might get more interested in that. I, I struggle with a lot of patients being very needle phobic and not wanting to inject. So I try to go for the transdermal if I can. And then your comment about surgery is a really good one. Um, there are some of the surgeries such as quote top surgery, mastectomy for, for um, trans men that are relatively easily available. Um, I think sexual reassignment surgery, there are still a paucity of surgeons. There really is, is not anyone in, in the state of Kentucky. Our patients have to leave the state and that's a huge challenge for them. Um, and then the cost is is prohibitive for so many of our patients. They have to, you know, the vast majority don't have any insurance contribution and it's it's very expensive. But I think, again, we're starting to see more and more um, surgical residency programs training, training residents in this as there's a, a greater demand. So hopefully that will get better in the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Tanak, for that wonderful presentation. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, don't forget, we have another EMI Live June 16th, focusing this time on acromegaly. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.